yesterday's prophecies for today's world. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer, and he is in you, and you need not be afraid. And now, Hal Lindsey's Bible study of the book of John. You know, when God sees one of his children in an impossible situation, giving praise to him, things start shaking. Remember the apostle Paul and Silas, when they were put in prison in Philippi, they were in the lower dungeon with the rats chained to the wall. Their backs raw from having been beaten. And the apostle Paul could have sat there and just said, woe is me. I came to this city, Lord, because by a vision you directed me to come here. And I've been seeking to bring people to faith in you. And now look at what you've done. You let me be beaten and I'm here sitting here kicking rats out of the way. And my back hurts. No, instead of doing that, it says that he and Silas started singing praises to God. <laughs> and an earthquake hit that place and shook everything up and everybody's chains fell off. All right, now let's look at uh, what follows here. Verse 14, when therefore the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is of a truth, the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, therefore, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. All right, now, you see, they were following Jesus, and they were listening, and they wanted to make him king, but with the wrong motives. Because all they could see in Jesus as the prophet Moses had promised was somebody who could take care of the physical needs. They had not come to see yet that he had come to take care of their spiritual needs first and foremost. And so he begins to separate the true seekers from the false seekers right here. So he goes off into a mountain to pray. In verse 16, now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. And after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. And it had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. Well, you know, uh, if there's any human ability that these apostles had, it was seamanship, and especially on this lake. And they were very aware of the kind of storms that could come up on this lake and so forth. So uh, Jesus had apparently told them, if I don't come down, you go on. And so they, they saw it was getting dark, and they could see that the wind was picking up a little bit. So they started out. If you've ever been to the, over to uh, the area of Tiberias and you've ever been to the Sea of Galilee, you know that you're 600 and something feet below sea level. And there are mountains around uh, the whole perimeter of this uh, lake. And there are different passes that come through those mountains. And wind can come into that. And it becomes like a funnel, and the passes make it begin to swirl. And because the lake is not real, real deep, the combination of that means that a storm can come up that is absolutely terrifying in a very brief time. And so they started out without Jesus, and uh, they were trying to make it back over to the Jewish area in the, the north, the north eastern part of the Sea of Galilee. And as they got away from land and they got out uh, going toward that uh, other perimeter, they were hit with a big storm. All right. 
This is test number two. First of all, we have to ask some questions. Where is Jesus? He's up in the mountain alone, isn't he? What's he doing? Pray. Why did he let those men go out on the lake? Did he know a storm was coming? Yeah, he did. Beginning to get the picture? So what was he praying about? He was praying that the 12 knuckleheads would have learned from what they had just seen him do and be able to transpose that to this new impossible situation and trust him. Once again, when you begin to want to be used by the Lord, and if he's going to use you, then get set for him to send you out into the storm. And uh, so here they are out in the storm. And let me tell you something. I have been on the Sea of Galilee when uh, I, I remember the, it, this storm came up in a matter of 15 minutes. And there were a bunch of uh, uh, seminary professors and so forth on the boat at this time that was a sp special uh, briefing tour that we had there. And uh, the storm came up, and I'm telling you, the boat started rocking, and it looked like the boat was going to sink. And I, <laughs> I saw all kinds of professors panic. And they were, they were on the floor, oh, Lord, I don't want to die now. <laughs> I'm an ex-tugboat captain. I've been in all kinds of situations like that. So, uh, But that didn't serve me well there. I just did this. I just said, Lord, I know we're out here for a reason. This, this is not, I don't know about these guys, but I know it isn't my time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just trusted him. We, we got through it. And uh, the Lord got us across. But you know something? Look at what happened. So it says in verse uh, 18, And the sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. And when therefore they had rowed about three or four miles, they beheld Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. And they were willing, therefore, to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now, they had, they had been rowing for hours, and they'd only gone about three or four miles because of the fierce wind. And... <laughs> scared the daylights out of him, but here's Jesus casually strolling on the water out there in the middle of that storm. But the key was, as soon as they were willing to take him aboard, the problem was instantaneously solved. They miraculously were rocketed in that little boat to where they were going. Now this, you know, the previous miracle of this chapter was seen by the whole crowd. And so it could, it was to help them see that they could believe in Jesus. And at the center of that, it was to help his disciples even more to believe in him. But this miracle was focused only on the apostles because they're the only ones that saw it. And at least they received him. Now, we know from uh, Matthew that an incident did happen while this was going on, that Peter 
Peter uh, hollered out to the Lord, and he said, Lord, if it's really you, command me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus said, come. Well, Peter's faith was good. He, you know, in this incident that's recorded in Matthew, at this same time, Peter, you know, he steps out and he kind of leans halfway on it, foot held him up on top of the water. And, you know, he's letting go with one hand and finally lets go with both hands and he looks at the Lord, look, Lord, no hands, you know. And so it says he actually started out walking on the water. But when the wind blew water over his face, he took his eyes off of Jesus and looked at the storm. And to himself, he said, what am I doing out here? And he started sinking. Because, you see, if you take your eyes off the problem solver and put them on the problem, you're going to sink right under the storm of life. And that's what this is all about. We're all going to have storms. But the issue is learn to trust Jesus in the storm because he's right there with you. And you know, the thing that is most difficult to learn is to keep on trusting. Not just for, you know, some people in their faith are like sprinters. <sighs> Boy, they run 100 meters and <laughs> faith's finished, down they go. God wants us to be distance runners in our faith. And so as he develops our faith, he may delay your, the answer to your faith, even though you're believing him. But don't give up. Keep on believing. Because he'll never forsake you. Ever. And that's why, you know, you don't want to be like, you know, this one person, Lord, I want patience, and I want it right now. That's why I, I, I shudder sometimes when, you know, I, of course, when, we're, when we find out we're very, very sick, in some cases fatally sick, of course the human thing is we immediately want to be healed. But God says, hey, just put your life in my hands and seek my will. Seek to understand what I have purposed in this and be more concerned about what my purpose is than just getting an immediate relief. And so that's why we need to trust him and to keep on trusting. For who are we going who else are we going to go to? No one else can do anything about it, so let's keep trusting him. And it'll always be and turn out for the best. All right, so we read here now in verse 22. The next day the multitude that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no one other than the small boat there except the one that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. And when the multitude therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? They knew that something unusual had happened because... He was already there. But I want you to note something. Jesus doesn't answer how he got there because he's focusing on one thing now. And this is a beginning of a section where Jesus challenges 
the people's motives, the people at large's motives that were following him. It's verses 26 through 40. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give to you. For on him the Father, even God, has set his seal. They said therefore to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? There's one of the most important questions that you can ask. What shall I do that I might work the works of God? Now, in this question, what are they really asking? What work can I do to be accepted with God? Well, he answers them. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. This is the only acceptable work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. See, that's the only way that we can be acceptable with God, to believe in Jesus whom God has sent. In other words, the only work of God is something that's not a work at all. It's faith. And Jesus, uh, I'm thankful that the Apostle John, over and over, all the way through this book, that's why uh, Dr. Tenney called it the book of belief. He keeps emphasizing the necessity of coming to God by faith alone. They said, therefore, to him, what then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? What have they just seen? Hey, if that's not enough, just go to hell and be done with it. <laughs> and they even specified what kind of sign they'd like to see. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. And you know how God's sense of humor. Remember? What does manna mean? What is it? first Israelite that came out of his tent when God first sent manna looked at these wafers on, on the ground and on the bushes and everything and said, manna. And God said, okay, Moses, that's its name. Manna, what is it? So they ate what is it for over 40 years. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Man, see, <laughs> these guys are even quoting scripture. <laughs> and Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. Now, see, now he's distinguishing between the type, the whole thing of the bread manna being sent from heaven was a type of the true life giver that would come out of heaven. And Jesus, in the rest of this chapter, eight times, it says, he came down out of heaven. He goes on to say, For the bread of God is he who comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. I don't know why. That's, it's in the masculine case. I don't know why they don't translate it as it should be. He who come, comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. All right, that's the first time it says he came down out of heaven. Okay. They said, therefore, to him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. 
See, he's really beginning. He's at the height, pinnacle of popularity. And now he's going to separate because he knows some of these people are not seeking him. They're seeking what he can give them in a human sense. But they're not looking for the spiritual things he can bring them, which are the greatest need we have. And so in verse, verses 37 through 40 are probably uh, some of the deepest theological concepts in the Word of God. It says in verse 37, all that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Better term is I will never under any circumstances cast out. And then in verse 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing. Not one is what it says literally in the Greek. I lose not one, but raise him up on the last day. Boy, if you ever wanted security about your salvation, there it is. All that the Father has given me in eternity past will what? Come to me. All right, have you come to Jesus and say, Lord, I come with nothing but faith, and I receive the gift of pardon that you died to give me. Thank you for dying for my sins. All right, if you've done that, you have come to him. So that means you are one of those that it says all that the Father gave me shall come to me. You're part of the ones that he gave. And then it says, for this is the Father's will, that of all he has given me, now who are those who, that he's given? The ones that came to him, okay? That I lose not even one, but raise him up on the last day. And that means if one of you who believe in Jesus for salvation is lost, Jesus did not fulfill the will of his father for why he came. Because the father's will is all that he gave him in eternity past will come to him. Those two come to him. Not one of them are going to be lost, but he must raise them up on the last day. Are you following me? Verse 40. Here's the other side of it. For this is the will of my father. It's so important he states that this is father's will again. That everyone, draw a line or draw a circle around everyone and connect it to lose nothing. That everyone who beholds the son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. That's eternal security. That's why he said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who may sin. A lot of people say, well, it sounds hell like that's uh, predestination. Well, let me put it this way. You have to look at every theological problem in the light of the character of God. God is omniscient. What does that mean? He knows all things. God is eternal. Connect eternity with knowing all things. So that means there never was a time when God didn't know all things, possible or Possible, probable, or impossible. He knows all, even the conceivable things that could happen. But he knows all things. And then he says, 
And this is the Father's will. That everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. Was there ever a time when God didn't know you would believe him? No. There never was a time when he didn't know that you would believe in his son. So you have to divorce yourself from time and space. God's not, that's a creation. That's not bounding on God. Uh, there never was a time when God didn't know you. There never was a time when God didn't know that you would believe. And he just picked you out and gave you to the son before, he, before the world was made. And he says, now every one of these, son, you're going to die for them. Every one of them that sees you and believes in you, you are not to lose even one of them, but you're to raise them up on the last day. And I hear it, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, I have a few more things to say about this next week, but uh, let's pause there. Now, knowing, knowing that you are already forever in God's hand, in his family, knowing that you're going to spend eternity with God, knowing that Jesus is not going to lose you. He is going to raise you up into heaven in an eternal resurrection body. Just knowing and counting on that should make you able to withstand and go through anything. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. But when you really get a grip on the fact that Jesus so saves you when you simply admit your sins and receive the gift of pardon that you are already in heaven as far as he's concerned. Thank you so much for standing with me as a watchman on the wall. I pray daily that he will reward your faithfulness and protect and prosper you in these difficult times. Thank you again for being a vital part of my team. You can find more of Hal Lindsey at his website, www.howlindsey.com. There you can access our video and article archives. Visit our online store for Hal Lindsey's CDs, books, and other specialty items. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit howlindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.